People are in trouble all the time. Well, they look okay to me. You know, it, it's kind of like, think about it this way. This is a good illustration. If you're running down the highway and you look at all the other cars, the vast majority of them seem to be doing just fine. You know, they're traveling. They, they seem to be traveling, you know, running smoothly down the road and all that. But unless you get real close to it and roll the window down, you can't tell if that thing's running right or not. It could be clattering and banging. You don't know. Isn't that right? Now, if the tire's out of balance, you can see that. You know, it's jumping around and all that. But all, all the other stuff, you don't know if it's running right or not. See, and what we'll do is we'll cruise along in life and we'll look at people around us and we'll think, they're all right. Don't know that. We don't know that until we get close to them. Amen. So, so we need to be paying attention to what God is doing. Because he'll tell you, their motor's uh, out of whack. <laughs> yeah. Those rods are knocking over there. Can't you hear it? <laughs> Amos 5, verse 14 says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. Hallelujah. Seek good and, well, and some, you know, a lot, of times Christians, a lot of times Christians look at that and they say, Well, that's what I'm doing. Are you? Well, yes, I'm trying to be pleasing to the Lord. Well, we're not supposed to be pleasing to the Lord as far as that goes. There's only one thing that pleases God anyway. Hello? Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So anything that's done outside of faith, God don't care about. Well, it's a good thing. Yeah, but he don't care. Amen. Well, I think he does. Well, you can think whatever you want to, but the Bible says without faith it's impossible. Well, I like what I'm doing. Fine. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I'm just saying it doesn't impress God. The only thing that impresses God is faith. That's why it says without faith it's impossible to please God. So that means there's no other thing you can do. You know, it's like without gas, it's impossible to start your car. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you think about kerosene and diesel and everything else. If it requires gas, it is not going to run. Okay? So, seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Somebody was asking me, you know, uh, well, what do we need to do to get out of some of the mess we're in in this nation? You know, do we need to act right? Do we need to do better? What do we need to do? I said, well, really, in the church age, in the church age, God doesn't look at sinners. Because they're going to do that anyway. Say amen. God doesn't look at sinners because they're going to do their sinner thing anyway. He doesn't, he doesn't really, you know, he doesn't concern himself with it. Well, what's he concerned with then? The church. So if the church is not praying, if the church is not intercede, interceding, if the church is not doing what it ought to be doing in prayer, if the church is not actively seeking people to bring them into he to the heavenly realm, if the church is not doing what Jesus said to do, in, like, for example, in Mark chapter 16, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, all them things, if the church is not doing that, then God lays the problem at the feet of the church. Not that he's upset with the church, as far as that goes, but what he's doing is saying, look here, they've got all this mess. You know, you need to be praying. You need to be interceding. You need to be laying hands on the sick. You need to be casting out devils. Why aren't you doing those things? And then, when we begin to, things begin to change. You know, you, you might have heard me say this before. The safest place to be in the whole world during the first Gulf War was in the war as an American. Now, if you was on the other side, it was a terrible place to be. You're going to get wiped out. But 
it was actually safer to be in the war zone during the first Gulf War than it was to be a citizen in this country in, in the places that we call safe. Not every place in America is safe. But in the places we call safe, it was still safer to be over there where they were, you know, lobbing missiles every once in a while and stuff like that. Why? Why was it so safe over there? Well, because all these people in America got scared and they're praying for their boys. It's amazing what prayer will do if we'll do it. You know, people are dying going to hell all the time and we're like, hmm. Oh, well. Yikes. You know, one of the advantages that we have as spirit-filled believers is we can set our spirit to pray even though we don't know what he's saying through us. So you can say, you know, okay, I'm going to pray in the spirit for the next hour or so. Like, I, you know, I get to drive a lot. So I, for the next hour or so, I'm going to set my spirit to pray for those people that are lost. And p pick a particular area. Don't just, you know, scatter out there like a shotgun. Pick a particular area and pray for that. So And so we'll pray things out in the earth, but, you know, we need to get after this deal. Agreement with God rescues people. There's a whole, there are over 8 billion people on earth and God wants to save every one of them. Hallelujah. I mean, yeah, we're recording this. <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway. I'm not sure that, that, uh, we haven't got another generation or so ahead of us. You understand what I'm saying? There might be that much time ahead yet. Because there's some things that have happened in the earth, especially recently, that make it look that way. For sure there's a harvest coming. There's no doubt about that. So the most important thing that we do in our lives is to lead somebody else to Jesus. Let's look at uh, 1 Timothy and then we'll go to 2 Timothy and we'll close. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Wonderful what, you know, you think about it. You think about the Bible and what God has given to us. We have every piece of equipment that we would ever need. All we got to do is dig it out of there. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.14 says, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worth, worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, how could he say that? Because he was hating on God's people. Amen. Whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy. Not because he was hating on people, but because he desired to be right with God. Okay. For this reason, however, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for etern for everlasting life. <laughs> so you say, well, how am I supposed to live? Look at Paul. What do you mean? Read his epistles. Read the book of Acts. Look at Paul. How did Paul live? Copy that. Amen. Copy that. See, Jesus took the worst sinner of his day. Now, he wouldn't have been the worst sinner in our eyes. I mean, we, we wouldn't have thought too much. You know, we wouldn't have thought well of him because of what he was doing to the church. But we wouldn't have thought of him the worst kind of sinner. We usually think of criminals and stuff as being worse. But in the eyes of God, in the eyes of God he was the chief sinner. Isn't that amazing? Now, think about that. He, here's the Apostle Paul. I mean, you know, before he was the Apostle Paul, he's Saul, the sinner, 
going out, making a, wrecking the church. That's what the book of Acts says. He was wrecking the church. Wrecking the church, and in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was the chief sinner on earth. Not the Roman soldiers out there raping and hurting people. Paul was the worst sinner on earth. Why? Because he was wrecking God's own people. God doesn't like it when you mess with his people. And he doesn't like it when anybody messes with somebody, you understand me, but he really dislikes it when this happens, okay? So he took the worst sinner and made him an example of how to live. <laughs> and he's the pattern. So, And some people say, well, that means you got to, yeah, that's what that means. Whatever you see him doing, copy it. Paul was tireless in winning souls. But let me give you a secret about soul winning. It's not tiring. It's rewarding. And Paul finished it like this if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Winning souls has great reward. First in saving people, but then it also has a reward for us. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 says this, Finally, you know, the verse before that, he said, I have fought the good fight, I have run the race. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Not everybody that goes to heaven gets a crown. Amen. I'll give you an example. Now, you can do with this whatever you want to, but I do see in the Spirit. And I don't know why you'd be listening to me if you think I don't. We are in a Pentecostal church, in a Spirit-filled church, and if the minister don't see in the Spirit, I'd be like, mm, I don't know. Amen. So when, when my grandparents on my mother's side passed away, my grandfather passed away first and then my grandmother. Now, I don't know why I didn't understand it. I know these scriptures, but, you know, I didn't understand it. So I, when, my, when my grandmother passed away, does that mean yes or no? <laughs> so... When my grandmother passed away, I, I oftentimes see, see people when they go into heaven. My grandmother passed away, and she had lived her life the best she knew how. Okay? The best for her life was to be my grandfather's wife and to be a good wife to him, which she mostly did. I mean, everybody makes mistakes and all that, right? And, and so... She's being escorted into heaven. I don't know why this is, but angels always meet the women. The guys seem to run in by themselves. I don't know what that's all about. Maybe I'll discover it in Scripture one of these days. But anyway, so the angel met her and, you know, looped his arm with hers. And, and she was dressed in the most beautiful gown, just flowing white, just gorgeous and looked better than I'd ever seen her. And I'd seen pictures of her when she was young, but she, I mean, she just, she looked beautiful. And she had a crown on her head. And I thought, isn't that interesting? And, and so that she begins to go into inside of heaven, because the angel meets you outside of the gate and escorts you in. And she begins to go inside of heaven. And my grandfather's standing there. Now, he's wearing bib overalls, and he's leaning on a hoe. And I thought that's, you know, that's a contrast. <laughs> she, she looks like a queen. He looks like, you know, farm boy, which he was when he was growing up. But I thought maybe that's what that meant. And, and so they, they look at each other, and, and uh, he didn't say anything. He just smiled and nodded. You know, he's happy to see her because we're always happy to see people when they go into heaven. Amen. And so she, she just spoke his name and kept going just very elegantly. And so I didn't think too much of it. I just thought, you know, it was real pretty and everything. But after a while, I started thinking about it. What's the deal with the bib overalls? And how come she's dressed like a queen and wearing a crown and all that? 
And, and, you know, the more I thought about it, the more it bothered me. I thought, you know, I, I, I don't get that. Because the testimony that people, one person after another, the testimony that folks gave about my grandfather is he never said anything bad about anyone. And if you want to know what a Christian is supposed to live like, you just look at him. Because he, he was such a wonderful person, he really was. Okay? My grandmother, although she was a wonderful wife to him, she could be a little cranky from time to time and stuff like that. But that was just her. Okay? So I said, God, what is all that? Because it started to bother me. And I'm thinking, you know, that don't, that don't seem to add up, Lord. What is this all about? And so I started praying about it. And the Lord said, well, your grandfather, you remember the last thing you asked him, one of the last things you asked him? I said, yes. I asked him, did you ever think he was supposed to be a missionary or something? He said, no. No, I don't. And I knew he wasn't telling me the truth, but, you know, he's on his deathbed. You're not going to say anything. Not if you got any sense. And so I didn't, you know, okay, you know. He said, so your grandfather did not answer the call upon his life. So his position is low in heaven. He's there, and thank God for that, okay. But his position is low because he didn't answer the call of God on his life. He said, but your grandmother was just supposed to be a good wife to him, and she did it. And so she's wearing a crown. Amen. So, what about all that other stuff? She's got it. <laughs> Amen. So let's read this. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge. Who's the one that gives you the crown? The Lord, the righteous judge. Well, I don't like that. You're not the judge, thank God. Amen. Right? The Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And well, you know, didn't your grandfather was a Christian, didn't he love his appearing? No, he didn't answer the call. No, well, he, he's a Christian. I understand that. But he did not do what he was supposed to do in this life. He didn't heed the warning. Now, I don't say that to scare folks because it's not supposed to scare us. It's supposed to make us go, Lord, what am I supposed to be doing? Amen. Is there something I need to pay attention to? Maybe I need to pray some more. And, and really, what we need to do is listen more while we are praying. What am I supposed to be doing? Now, I was hoping I'd get to see you because I, I've been praying, you know, Lord, because you made a correction in your spirit. Now, you thought you just kind of made a decision in your mind, but you made a correction in your spirit. And because you made a correction in your spirit, not only is God going to bring you along in ways that you're already wanting him to, but he's also going to take care of things in your family that you have really thought were not going to happen. He's going to take care of it. Because you made an adjustment for him, he is going to take care of you and those that you love. And there's some hard cases. But he's going to take care of it. Now, I don't know. You never told me anything. I don't know anything about your family. Is that true? Okay. He's going to take care. He's going to take care of some of these things. You're just like, Lord, it's impossible. I just, you've kind of thrown up your hands to him. You know, I don't know what to do. But you made a correction. And he's going to take care of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful that we have inside information? You know, because we go along life and we think, you know, this thing ain't working sometimes. You know, we all get those kinds of thoughts. You know, what I'm doing, God, I'm trying. I'm doing the best I know how, that kind of thing. And, and all of a sudden, we just make something. It doesn't even, doesn't even seem like that big a deal. Just a little bitty adjustment, so to speak, that we make sometimes. And all of a sudden, the windows of heaven open up. And we're thinking, I didn't do that much. That's because we don't rightly perceive what God is doing and wanting to do with us. 
in something that seems small to us, you know, sometimes we make a, a little correction, and it seems little to us, but God's been trying to get us to make that correction for 20 years. And all of a sudden, we just make this little, it's, and it's not that big a deal it's, it's in terms of what we need to do to make that correction. But it's such a big deal to him that it just opens up things in a marvelous way for us. Hallelujah. It does for him, too. Amen. Hallelujah. Did I say anything? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You've already begun to accelerate, spiritually speaking. And uh, God's, <laughs> he's supercharging your engine been running around with a four banger and now you're getting a V8 and things are going to you're going to that's all I can say things are going to accelerate hallelujah thank you Lord thank you Jesus hallelujah thank you Lord Jesus I hear the sound of revival What does revival sound like? Well, the opposite of revival is when people are falling off that final cliff. That sounds awful. I've heard it. It's terrible. Thank you. The worst horror flick or worst gruesome preacher you've ever seen, this, is, this tops it big time. But revival... Is the sound of joy. Hallelujah. People go to their knees and say, Thank you, Lord, I'm saved. The sound of revival is coming into the land. I can hear it. Just like the rain. Thank you, Lord. Now think about this. Elijah didn't pray for it to stop raining. Did he? He said, at my word. That doesn't sound like a prayer. Prayer is God, you know. In, new, in the new covenant, Father in Jesus' name. He didn't do that. He made a proclamation. So, about a year ago, God said, it's going to be dry till the harvest starts. I hear the sound of joy. <laughs> Woo -wee. Thank you, Jesus, for the sound of joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the sound of joy that is coming into this land. Thank you, Lord, that you are going to reign upon this land. 